Stephen Elabo. Welcome me to Deeper Life Bible Church Ministry, Charlottesville, United States. It is our belief that you will listen to our general superintendent, Pastor W.F. Kumuyi, and other ministers of God from our ministry, and they are sharing the mind of God with you and your family. God bless you and remain blessed. I welcome every one of you to the Bible study tonight. We're now in Titus chapter 3. As we look at Titus chapter 3, I'm going to go back to Titus chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Just to show you that it's so very important we understand why the grace of God came into our lives. Why that grace of God has transformed our lives and then he wants us to go out and show that transformation and show that redemption that the Lord himself has granted us. I'm reading from Titus chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness in hope of eternal life everlasting life that's a salvation that's a redemption which god that cannot lie promised before the world began and so as we look at the epistle of paul to titus he emphasizes that eternal life he emphasizes that redemption he emphasizes that salvation that comes through the redemptive work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. And he tells us, it's not just that the grace of God came to us, the grace of God entered in, brought salvation, brought redemption, brought righteousness, and then works out that righteousness in our lives. Chapter 2, verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, in this present age, in the present society. It tells us that when that salvation comes, when that redemption comes, it accomplishes something. It does something. It turns us away from sin and turns us to the Savior, turns us away from darkness, turns us to the light, turns us away from evil, and it turns us to that which is good and righteous and pure in the sight of the Lord. Now he comes to chapter 3. And he's still going to emphasize that same eternal life. That same redemption. That same salvation. He tells us 9 verse 4. He says, but after that the kindness and the love of God as Savior toward man appeared. He goes on to say, not by works of righteousness which we have done. But according to his mercy he saved us. It's coming back to that same thing again, that same salvation. So very important. Because how shall we escape if we neglect or if we reject so great salvation, which was spoken of by the Lord and revealed unto us by his own disciples who heard him? He said, He has saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It says uh, the Father is involved with our salvation. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, is involved with our salvation because Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. The Holy Ghost, now we are told, is involved with that salvation. It's a Trinitarian salvation by the Father by the Son, and by the Holy Ghost, the washing and regeneration by the Holy Ghost, which is shared on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by His grace. Again, He's telling us about that salvation. He uses another word now, that's justification. It brings us to the law court of God, and it says, we are guilty. For all have seen and come short of the glory of God. But now Jesus Christ paid the price. He stood in our place. And because of his sacrifice, which became a substitution for us, now we're justified. It's like we have never seen because he took our sin. He took our shame. He took our suffering upon himself. Because we're justified, he tells us, by his grace, we should now be made heirs according to the hope of 
everlasting eternal life. I come back to verse 4. It says in verse 4, but after, after what? It's telling us that this is what we were before salvation came. This is what we did before salvation came. This is the life we live, the character we manifested, the behavior we demonstrated before that salvation came. Then you said, after that now. After what? After repentance. After what? After redemption. After what? After turning to the Lord. It says, after then the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, now toward us appeared. It came to us. And we embraced it. And we believed it. And we accepted it. And something happened in our lives. A change came. Because if any man be in Christ, tell me out loud. It's a new creature. All things are passed away. And behold, all things have become new. It tells us what we were. Look at verse 3. In verse 3 it says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. A foolish sinners are because they act without thinking of the consequence they behave and live without thinking of the judgment to come how foolish we were when we lived in sin when we practiced sinful things without knowing that judgment was coming it says that's what that's what we were we were disobedient and we were deceived and were serving diverse different laws and pleasures and it says we're living in malice even who are living in hatred, hateful and hating one another. But that's not the end of the story. If that's the end of your story, you'll be lost forever. If all your story is there is envy, there is jealousy, there's disobedience, there's deception, there's hatred, you hated one another. If that's the end of your story, that's perdition, that's damnation, that's eternal judgment, that's hellfire forever and ever. But if that story does not end there and something then happens that the grace of God appears the salvation of God appears righteousness appears it comes from Calvary and then it comes to your heart you believe that and embrace that and you can say but for but after that the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared I believed I embraced it I got it and something happened to me. We're talking about God's indispensable goodness. His indispensable goodness. The salvation that came, what could we have done? How could we have saved ourselves? We couldn't even have conceived of the plan of salvation because of what we were. Our depravity, our disobedience, our delusion will not allow us to even think of the way out. But God planned our salvation. We are lawless and loveless. And we were under hatred and we hated each other. We deserved nothing but punishment, eternal punishment. We have been driven out of the original garden of divine pleasure driven out of his provision and fellowship and there was no way back to the divine human relationship and fellowship and partnership but the kindness of god but the love of god appeared that's what changed the situation i believe it has appeared to you and you embraced it if you embrace that and believe that and accept that that's what makes the change and the transformation in your life and everybody else can see something has happened to you you're no longer the way you are the kindness of god had come actually that word kindness in the original greek is goodness that's why instead of putting the title as a sin dispensable kindness we just say indispensable goodness actually it tells us that all the goodness of god even before one said was leading us one direction look at uh, romans chapter 2 in romans chapter 2 i'm reading here from verse 4 it says the goodness of god the kindness of god the provision of god the blessing of god the provision of god in our lives leading us in one direction that's the direction of repentance redemption and righteousness and salvation romans chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 4 or despises thou the riches of his goodness that's the word kindness there the riches of his goodness the riches of his provision 
the, the, the riches of his compassion and forbearance and, forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness, the kindness, the mercy, the compassion, the love of God leadeth thee to repentance. Everything God does in our lives is to lead us back to himself. He created us. And he gave his only begotten son as the final sacrifice for our salvation. And so whatever he does in our lives is to lead us back. His goodness, his compassion, his mercy, his love, his answered prayers. Everything he does is to remind us, I'm for you. I want to bless you. And I want to get you to heaven eventually. And then that leads us to repentance and we come to the Lord. Our redemption, our salvation, our provision, our preservation is totally unmerited. Whatever spiritual blessing or temporal benefit we have or enjoy, it is due to the kindness of God, the goodness of God. It is not our goodness, nothing in us, nothing in us qualifies us for God's favor, for God's fellowship. Nothing in us merits the common goodness of God or the uncommon provision of God. It's usual and unusual gifts. Nothing in us merits that. We earn nothing of his grace, of his goodness, of his gifts. It's all of grace. Without God's indispensable goodness and mercy and compassion, we shall be miserable and lost forever. But thank God, God is love. And God is good. And God is compassionate. And out of that compassion, he has sent his salvation unto us. Before I leave that introduction, I want to tell you something. We're talking about redemption. Have that in your mind. Redemption. We are lost. We are sold to sin. And sold to Satan. And sold to evil. And without the grace of God coming in, that will, it will seal our doom forever. But, number one, as the cause of redemption. The cause of redemption. That is, his goodness, his love, his mercy, his compassion. That's the very source, that's the very reason for redemption. But not only the cause, number two now, is the consequence of redemption. There are many people, you know, walking around and saying, I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed. We say, yes, you are redeemed. Where is the consequence of that redemption? Where is the result of that redemption? Where is the outcome of that redemption? What's the cause of our redemption? Come back to chapter 3, verse 4. It says, after that, the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, through man, uh, toward man, appeared. That is the cause, the kindness of God, the goodness of God, the grace of God, the love of God, the compassion of God. What's the consequence of that redemption? What happens to your life? What happens to your soul? What happens to your spirit? How can we tell? That's a redeemed man. That's a redeemed woman. This man is saved. This man has tasted of the grace of God that brings salvation and redemption. How can we tell the consequence? Look at this. If the kindness has brought you into the kingdom, the kindness becomes part of your life. We're looking at Colossians chapter 3 verse 12. Colossians chapter 3, and I'm reading here from verse 12. Colossians chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 12. You cannot just say, I've received of the kindness of God, but I cannot distribute, I cannot uh, reflect that kindness of God. You experience it, it comes to you, you express it, it comes from you. In Colossians chapter 3, I'm reading here from verse 12, it says, put on, therefore, What's it there for? For because you've got the redemption now, you've tasted of the kindness of God, you've tasted of the goodness of God. Therefore, put on as the elect of God, holy and beloved, by wells of mercies. Tell me the next word there: kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long suffering. It says because you've got the uh, kindness, give it out. You've experienced that kindness. Express it at well. You received it, reflect it, show it that you have got the kindness of God in you. And that kindness will reflect to other people around you. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 32 kindness that will reflect after we have got it. In uh, chapter 4 of Ephesians, uh, verse 32, but 
be kind one to another. I cannot find, uh, you know, any passage of the Bible that says this man is saved and cruel. Saved and wicked. Saved and evil. Saved and hating. You cannot find that. If you're saved, the consequence of that salvation if you are born again, the consequence of that new birth, if you have tasted of the kindness of God, and that kindness of God, that goodness of God has appeared unto you, you believed it, you experienced it, you have, you have received it, then you will show it and reflect it in lives of other people. So it says, be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. I pray to reflect more and more in our lives in Jesus' name. As we look at this study, it's indispensable goodness. I divide to three parts. Number one, God's undeserved grace for hateful sinners. God's undeserved grace for hateful sinners. Number two, God's joy undeniable growth of his sons. If you are a real child of God, there will be growth there. It will be visible. It will be known by the people that know you. They will know that what you are today is greater, is higher, is brother, gone, has gone richer and farther than what you were yesterday. That every new day, every new week, every new month, the attributes of the believer, they have been developed in your heart. There will be that undeniable growth in grace and growth in the love of God grows in the kindness of God in your life. And then number three now, great undeveloped gifts of his servants. We'll come back to number one, God's undeserved grace for hateful sinners. Well, you see, uh, the grace of God comes to us when we were still weak, when we didn't have any goodness at all. There are many people that do not understand that. They say, I want to become better. Then I'll have the grace of God. Grace is gift. Grace is free. We don't buy it with anything. We just come as we are. And as we come to the Lord, that grace meets us and the grace cleanses our lives and changes our lives and makes a transformation of our lives, which he will do for you if, if you've not got it. If you've got it already, he'll do more of it in your life in Jesus' name. In Titus chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 4, Titus chapter 3, and we're looking at it from verse 4, Titus chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 4. It says, but after that, the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. Then it goes on to say very quickly, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. According to his mercy, he saved us. And look at uh, Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And it says, uh, this is where we all were. We're all sinners. We are lost, we are sinful, we need to have, we need to know the way of righteousness. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Once again, I want to remind you that's not the end of the story. If that is the end of the story for humanity, then we are lost forever. Then we will not get to heaven. Then we will spend eternity in hell. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. By the way, there are some people, that's where they stop. Oh, they say, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You confront them with repentance. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You confront them with the new life that ought to come to a believer. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. It doesn't say all are sinning. It doesn't say all must sin. It's talking of the past. Before we knew Christ, before the grace of God came in, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then it goes on to verse 24, being justified. Move on. Don't stay in that sin. Don't abide in that defilement. Don't stay in that evil. Don't keep on saying all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm not perfect. I'm not, I know I'm evil. All I've seen and come short of the glory of God. Now move on. It says being justified freely by his grace 
through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth in propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission removal for the cleansing of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. It's through that kindness of God, that goodness of God, that salvation comes. I pray it will come to you. And if it has come, I pray it will abide. And it's by faith. It's by faith. It gives us by grace and it's all free. It's all paid for because Jesus paid it all. And now we can come and receive that thing and it is ours by faith. In chapter 4 of Romans, I'm reading from verses 4 and 5. Romans chapter 4, verse 4. It says, Now to him that walketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. That is, if you have to work for salvation, I pay the pastor's due. And then I've done this, I give money to the beggars, I go to church, I do this, I do that. That is by works. Then there's no grace. And you can only have salvation by grace. That's why it says in verse 5, But to him that walketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly. He justifies the ungodly. He says the captive free. He says, I released you from that sin. I paid the price for you. I shed my blood for you. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world because he justifies the ungodly. His faith is reckoned and counted for righteousness. As we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's how the righteousness comes. But please remember that once you are saved, then there is good works. Once you are saved, there's a new life. Once you are saved, the love of God comes into you. And that love of God is expressed. It beams out. Look at chapter 5 of Romans. Romans chapter 5, verse 4, verse 1. It says, therefore. That's already telling you something. Therefore, therefore, therefore. In chapter 4, it's talking about salvation. It's by grace. It's by faith. It's free. We didn't work for it. We received it from the Lord. Now it says, therefore, because we have got it from God, therefore, be justified by faith. We have, tell me, peace with God. All the confusion of mind is gone. All the fear of judgment is gone. All the terror of the coming judgment, the wrath of God, all that is come. All the fear of hell fire at the end of a sinful life, all that is gone. It says, therefore now we're justified by faith and we're peace we go through our Lord Jesus Christ in whom also we have, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. I pray you will stand. And rejoice in the hope of glory. Look at verse 5. It says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. It says, We are saved by the love of God, and that love of God comes into our hearts and is shed abroad in our hearts. It covers everywhere, it goes everywhere. There's no hatred in one corner. And there's no malice in another corner. There's no deception in another corner of the heart. The love of God that saves us now is spread abroad in our heart. And it says, by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. That's why every word will come out of love. Every action will come out of love. And the behavior is influenced, inspired by the love of God. The love that saves is the love that also transforms your life and makes you to reflect that to other people. Look at verse 17. In verse 17 it says, For if by one man's offense, that's range by one, much more they which receive of the abundance of grace. Receive the abundance of grace. All the grace you need to live a new life is available. I said it's available. If you're facing temptation, and you say, my temptations are great, there's greater grace that will make you go through. 
If you face any trial that you say, I have a great trial. How can I live the Christian life? There's an abundant grace that's available. It's yours today in Jesus' name. And of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. It says that grace reigns in our lives. And you see this grace is available to everyone. It's not just that, you know, some people are selected. Some people are chosen and the other people, they are rejected. If you look at uh, Psalm 145, Psalm 145, you will see that this goodness of God is available for you, for me, for everyone. Psalm 145, and we're reading from verse 9. 145, verse 9. The Lord is good to how many people now? To all people, open your Bible, mark this your Bible, because you see, there are some people that might tell you some people are predestined to heaven, and some people are predestined to hell fire, some people are selected to be saved, and some people are selected to be lost, some people are the elect of God. Whatever they do, whether they do good or they do bad, whether they pray or they don't pray, they repent, they don't repent, they're already elected for eternal life and they will be saved. Other people, whether they want to repent or not, they want grace or not, it's unfortunate for them. That's what they teach. They say that they're elected for perdition. But look at this, verse 9. Are you there? I said, are you there? Yeah. Psalm 145, verse 9. The Lord is good, tell me to all and his tender mercies over all his works. Satan did not create anybody. God created every one of us. Where the work of his son and his tender mercies, the mercy that brings salvation, the mercy that brings conversion, the mercy that brings regeneration, redemption, that tender mercy is for everyone. It is for you. If you've not got it, it's because you are neglecting it, but it's available for you. You will get it today. I'm reading here now from Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 5. It tells us about this mercy of God and the love of God. God is rich unto all. It says, it tells us in verse 5, Ephesians chapter 2, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved. By grace are ye saved. Look at verse 9. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And uh, the, the Apostle Paul talks about himself. He gave testimony concerning himself. He said, if you're thinking you're so bad, you cannot be saved. I about me. I went farther than you have gone. And yet I got saved. And I got saved so that I can be a pattern unto all the other people that will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. 4 Timothy chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me. For he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Who was? It's not like that anymore. You see, when you come to the Lord, all your past life is gone. It's past. It's like water under the bridge. But you can remember that and be grateful to God that I am not what I used to be. I don't go where I used to go. I don't do what I used to do. I don't wear what I used to wear. I don't drink what I used to drink. All that is gone. It's past tense. That's why it says in verse 13, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy. You will obtain mercy. Or, you know, whatever you have done, how far you have gone, the mercy of God is like a deep white ocean. The mercy of God is waiting for you. And you receive that mercy in Jesus' name. Because I did it in ignorance, ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Then he says, this is a faithful saying. And it's worthy of all acceptation. What does that mean? It says, 
this is a saying that is faithful to the word of God. We talk about mercy. That's a faithful saying. It is a saying. It is a statement that is faithful to the nature of God. It is faithful to the word of God. It is faithful to the revelation of God. And it is worthy of being accepted by everybody. Accepted by all. Look at that again. This is a faithful saying. And worthy of all acceptation. That Christ Jesus came into the world to die. To, to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now people they misunderstood that. They thought Paul the apostle was saying, Jesus came to save sinners. And then they cut up the word save. And they preserved the word sinners. And he said, of whom I am chief. What they, meant, what they mean by the interpretation is, I am still the chief of sinners. Uh -uh, that contradicts if any man be in Christ. It's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. What he means is this. He came to save sinners. The unsaved are on this side. The saved are on this other side. And now, among those who are saved, sinners who are saved, who are rescued, I am on the side of those who are saved. I look around me, and I see that I'm the chief among them. I went beyond all of them. I sinned beyond all of them. They are saved. I am saved. I'm the chief among those who are saved by grace. It's like I've become different. Your life will be different. Look at verse 16 here. How be it? It says, in any case now, for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern, for an example, for a model to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. What he's saying is, it happened to me. It's a model for you. It's a pattern for you. It will happen to you. He saved me. He said, that's a pattern. It will happen to you. He has changed my life. He said, that's a pattern. It will change your life as well. Now, when we become saved, we need to understand. We do not remain in that same position. Let me tell you this way. First of all, it's a sinner. He's saved, he becomes a son. He doesn't even just remain ordinary son, he becomes a saint. He doesn't remain just ordinary saint, he becomes a servant of God. It's a progression. It's a growth. That is, you are a sinner. Grace came into your life, brought salvation. You are now a son of God. As many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And then, now that the grace of God brought salvation to you, you are a son of God, a member of the family of God, you move on again, grace comes again, you are a saint. Now that you are a saint, you live godly, you live righteous, and then you come now eventually to being the servant of God. Look at it this way now. A sinner, grace comes, changes him. He becomes a son, the goodness of God also comes into his life. Sinner, grace comes. A son, the goodness of God comes. He becomes a sage. Godliness comes into his life. He becomes a servant of God and the gift of God comes into his life. You're not static. You're not remaining in just that step or that place where you have always been. You're moving on. You will move on. Yeah. I said you will move on. Yeah. You'll be better tomorrow than you were today. Yeah. Better next week than you are this week. The glory of God will transform your life in Jesus' name. I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, a change must come upon your life. Amen. You cannot bath in water all the time and remain dirty. You will be clean. Amen. Look at chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 18. It says, but we all 
How many of us? How many people are going to grow? You will grow. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory as by even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I come to point number two now. We're talking of gradual, undeniable growth of his sons. That means you are no more a sinner. You are born again. You become a son of God, a daughter of God. And with that change, growth begins. We come to Titus chapter 3. And I'm reading here from verse 4. Titus chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 4. It says, but after that the kindness and the love of God, our Savior toward man appeared. What he's saying there is that we were sinners, but the change has come. How? Through the kindness of God. We were evil, but now we're good. How? Because of the kindness of God, which is the mercy of God, which is the goodness of God, which is the compassion of God, and which is the thing that brought us into redemption. And when you are saved by that kindness, you're also nurtured by that kindness. Understand that. The grace of God changed you. That grace of God will also sustain you to make you grow. The love of God changed you. That love of God will also nurture you to make you grow. The grace does not come into your life and then stop there. Finished. I'm saved by grace. And that's all. Grace goes all the way through. From being a sinner to being a son. Being a son to being a saint. Being a saint to be a servant of God. Grace goes on all the time. And let me illustrate this for you concerning this kindness of God. This kindness of God. Let me tell you something, uh, you know, which is uh, very important. You might discover that I'm reading some references that were not, uh, you know, you don't find on your outline here. The original outline was used in our Leadership Strategy Congress for leaders and for pastors and for overseers. But now we're bringing it to the whole church. That's, that's why we need to make it available now for the whole church and make the whole church understand this. So we're not taking the approach of just Leadership Congress. That's why you'll find some of the references now for you. Actually, it gives you extra how important you are in the sight of God. I said you're important in the sight of God. So I'm reading to you now what brought us in, into the kingdom, into redemption. It is the kindness of God. Let me show you. In 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 3. 2 Samuel chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 3. It says, and the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him. Mark that in your Bible. The kindness of God. How does the kindness of God act? How does it react? How does it come into your life? David said, I'm looking for somebody in the house of Saul and I want to show the kindness of God unto him. The first thing you realize is that Saul did not merit any kind of kindness. The first thing you realize is that all the sons of um, Saul, nobody merited the kindness of God. The same thing of the descendants of Adam, the same thing of the human race, nobody merits the kindness of God. But Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of God, he, he said, I want to show kindness to the people that do not merit it. That's how you got saved. You didn't merit it, but thank God you are saved. You didn't qualify for it, but thank God you are saved. It is the kindness of God. He goes on in that place, and Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan has yet a son, which is lame in his feet. Lame, helpless. Lame, impotent. Lame, not complete. That's what the sinners were. We, we were lame. We couldn't run the race before us. We couldn't walk in righteousness before us. We couldn't, we couldn't live the righteous life in our strength. Were you not lame? 
Were you not impotent? Were you not powerless? Were you not unable to live a righteous life? The things I wanted to do, I could not do. The way I wanted to go, I could not go. The evil I didn't want to do, that's what I did. If I did that which I didn't want to do, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. That's where we were. And then the kindness of God came. You see what the Lord is telling us? It is not by marriage. It's not by qualification. It is by the mercy, compassion, and the goodness, and the love, and the kindness of God. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Mecha, the son of Amiel in Lodiba. And the king David sent and fetched him out of the house of, of Mecha, at the son of Amiel from Lodiba. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not. Isn't that what the Lord has told us? When we thought he has called us to judgment. When we thought we're part of the human race that have gone astray. And then the, the kindness of God said, fear not. Mercy has come. Fear not, love has come. For God so loved the world, the sinful world. For God so loved the world, the shameful world. For God so loved the world, the sorrowful world. For God so loved the world, the suffering world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever in that sinful world believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life that's how you came in i said that's how you came into the kingdom of god not by marriage the kindness of god the love of god the compassion of god it says fear not for i will surely show thee the ki kindness for jonathan thy father's sake and will restore thee all the land of saul thy father and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually you see how god has made us part of his family not by marriage but by the kindness of god that's how redemption came. That's how salvation came. And it says, and he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then, came, then the king called unto Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son, that's unto this Mephibosheth, all that appertain to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore, and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruit, and that, the, that thy master's son may have food to eat, but Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Zeba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Zeba unto the king, according to all that my lord the king has commanded, a servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, uh, and uh, as for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. You see what the Lord has done? It's now made us like one of his sons or enemies but now jesus says i call you friends he says we're members of the same family now all by grace that's what has happened to you i said that's what has happened to you and then in verse 12 and mephibosheth were told at a young son whose name was maka and then all that dwelt and all that dwelt in the house of ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem. We are going to do in the new Jerusalem above. For he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both feet. Impotent, powerless, not able to do anything, but became part of the family of God. But now, the kindness of God brought us in. What will not show us that we grow? What will nurture us that will develop? The same kindness of God will nurture us. You receive that kindness, you reflect that kindness.
You experience that kindness. You express that kindness. Let, let's come to the New Testament now, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm reading here from verse 6. What you have received, you must reflect. What you have experienced, you must express. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 6. You've got of that kindness of God manifest it to you, express it to you, show it to other people to by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love on pretending, love on hypocritical, love on fame, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. It says that's how we're to grow. That the kindness that brought you in will keep you in. And then you keep on growing in that kindness, showing it to all the people. If you don't show the kindness that God has given you, you're not going to grow as a Christian. You'll be stunted in your growth. You might even lose what you've got and become dead in sins and trespasses again. But you receive of that kindness, show the kindness. Receive of that love, show that love. Receive of the mercy, show that mercy. And receive of everything that Lord is giving to you. And then reflect it to all the people. Colossians chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 12. Colossians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 12. It says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, by words of mercy, his kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long suffering. That's what you nurture yourself in. If your life is a life of selfishness, self centeredness, only considering yourself, and there's no kindness, you'll never grow. But if you're going to grow, that gradual growth, that uh, consistent growth will come as you are manifesting that same kindness of God that has been shown unto you. Then it says, for bearing one another and forgiving one another. Isn't that what the Lord has done for us? He gave you forgiveness. That's how you came to the kingdom. It says, now if you are going to grow in your Christian experience, the same forgiveness I've given you, give that to other people too. It says, you are forbearing one another, you are forgiving one another. If any man have any quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. You'll do it in Jesus' name. You know, husband and wife will not divorce, they will not separate if they have this kindness. Because you are saved by grace. Show that grace to your husband, show it to your wife. You will not separate, you will not divorce because you are growing in love, growing in kindness, growing in compassion. Then it says, above all, in verse 14, above all these things, put on charity, that's love, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. To the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful, and be ye thankful. You are grateful every time. Mephibosheth was grateful to David. I don't merit this. I'm just like a dead dog. How is it? I'm going to eat at the king's table. There was gratitude. You are grateful to the Lord. How do you show gratitude to the Lord? You cannot see the Lord face to face, but you can see his children. You see, I'm going to be kind to the children of God. I'm going to show mercy to the children of God. I'm going to be merciful, considerate to the children of God. Why? Because I'm so grateful he showed mercy unto me. In verse 16, then it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord and whatsoever ye do. Remember that, whatsoever ye do. Have you got the kindness of God? The redemption of God? Are you born again? Are you a child of God? Are you on your way to heaven now? Here is the principle of your lifestyle, of your behavior. Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father by him. I pray that will show your life in my life and our lives together in Jesus name. Amen. Growing undeniable growth of the sons of God. It means there's addition in your life there's no subtraction. Give me a good amen there. Amen. 
in second peter second peter chapter one somebody wants to grow what does he do is looking at his life it says i'm going to add another thing today i'm going to add another virtue today i'm going to add another characteristic today second peter i'm reading from chapter one verse five it says beside this giving all diligence that means you are deliberate about this you are decisive about this and you are determined about this one it says beside this giving all diligence to add to your faith virtue don't let just faith be there it's like you're building the foundation is there but you're not putting anything on that foundation and that, that's not building if you're going to build you put something on that foundation faith is the foundation by grace you are saved through faith but add something there and it says when you give all diligence and you add to your faith virtue and add to your virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance add patience and to patience you add godliness and to godliness you add brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness you add charity look at verse 8 for if these things be in you and abound if these things be in you and increase if this be in you and multiply you see what we're not static as we're children of god we don't just become okay i'm born again i'm a child of god i'm a son i'm a daughter grow let there be increase let us keep on moving forward and you are today higher than you were yesterday in love in charity in kindness in goodness in mercy in compassion in consecration in zeal in fervency being passionate for the lord add something to your life every day and every week and every month and every year because if these things be in you and abound they make you that ye shall neither be barren you will not be spiritually barren no, uh, no unfruitful you will not be unfruitful in the knowledge of our lord jesus christ look at this other side now but verse 9 he that lacketh these things he that says i'm saved i'm saved that's all i know he that says i'm a child of god i'm a child of god don't bother me add this one add this one multiply this one and uh, bring in this one don't bother me with that i'm satisfied the way i am it says he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins wherefore the rather brethren children of god give diligence to make your calling and your election sure for if ye do these things ye shall never fall i will not fall you will not fall in jesus name first peter chapter 2 first peter chapter 2 you want to grow of course you ought to you ought to desire to grow and this is what makes us to grow in first peter chapter 2 verse 1 it says wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that she may grow thereby i will grow i said i will grow you will grow in jesus name we're looking at uh, first thessalonians chapter 3 and we're going to compare that with second thessalonians sorry chapter 1 verse 3 First Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3. Look at this. First Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3. It says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, you see that, and your labor of love, that's number two, and the patience of hope, that's number three, in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God our and our Father. It talks about our faith, our hope, and our love, our charity. Come to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith grows exceedingly. You see that? They were not static. They were just, not just staying in one place. I'm saved, I'm saved. In chapter, in chapter 1, verse 3 of 4 Thessalonians, it says, Your work of faith. And your patience of hope and your labor of love he said i can see that but now he comes right to them in second thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3 he says we're thanking god for you because it is uh, it is uh, meat because your faith grows exceedingly your faith will grow Amen. 
and the charity of the love of every one of you uh, all toward each other abound this that's the growth he expects from us and i pray that you and i all of us will manifest that growth in jesus name we we'll come to point number three now great undeveloped gifts of his servants i told you already the progression the progress that we make or we sinners grace came in we became sons of god more grace came in we became the saints of god more grace came in we became the servants of god i want you to understand that when we use the word gift we use the word grace sometimes we're referring to similar things look at this in ephesians chapter 2 ephesians chapter 2 grace comes in the gift is coming in ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of god the grace is the gift of god and the salvation that comes through that grace is the gift of god the redemption that comes through that is the gift of god and the opportunities and privileges that come as a result of that grace is the gift of god it is not of yourselves look at ephesians chapter 4 verse 7 ephesians chapter 4 verse 7 it says in verse 7 but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of christ you see that the grace the gift the gift and the grace sometimes they are interchangeable in first peter chapter 4 i'm reading from verse 10 first peter chapter 4 and here we're looking at verse 10 the gift of God comes into our lives. But he wants us to develop that gift and to make use of that gift. First, first Peter chapter 4, we're reading from verse 10. It says, as every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Gift of God, grace of God. Now, the other thing we're going to look at is this. We were sinners. How did any change ever happen? And what change actually happened? Salvation came in. How did that salvation come in? By grace. We're coming to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 and 5. To make a change from being a sinner to being a child of God, a son, a daughter of God, by grace, and it is a gift of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, for but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ, for by grace are ye saved. What brought the change? Grace. What change actually came in? Salvation. You were a sinner. Grace came in. The result, salvation. Now you are a child of God. What do you have again? Grace also still comes. And this grace now does something else. We're looking at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And I'm reading here from verse 11 all through to verse 14. Grace does not stop its active work. It's an active agent in our lives. From the point we're born again until we see him face to face in glory. In uh, Titus chapter 2 verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great god and our savior jesus christ look at this who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from how much of iniquity all iniquity Father, we thank you, Lord, because of the message you have given to us this afternoon. I pray by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ for every ear that are listening to the word, the 
it will be fruitful in their life in Jesus' name. And by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, every one of us shall dwell with you in the kingdom of God and in the last day. Thank you, O Lord, because you are the Lord that answers prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.